Mr. Mayfair really is um, an homage. The part of America that's very fascinating is the 60s. And I, I think that somehow I got stuck into that period in my head. I, I took the concept first to uh, Lonnie Ferry, my producing partner, uh, and, and I told him that I wanted to make a, a show that has a little bit of nostalgia. And I also told him that I would want to make something that's very uh, musical. Then we decided where we're going to shoot the show. Alan Latham who has a studio in England and who I produced many movies with in the past. I mean, I sent him the script and he loved it right away. The three of us sat down, Alan and, uh, and uh, Loni, and we decided to do it. I was approached by Philippe Martinez um, to do the films. It was a great opportunity to show off the studio. The story of Mr. Mayfair is the story of a New York um, mafia man coming to London to escape New York and setting up a nightclub in London. And then, out of the blue, his past catches up with him. So Mr. Mayfair, the role of Max Mayfair, is kind of the last of the Mohicans. You know, it's that, you know, there is a line where the movie opens where uh, he says, We'll be gone soon enough. Because th that generation is leaving us. He's trying to create a vibe that once was. And he does so, and it's very, very successful. And that, in a way, is, you, you could say is the launching pad of the character that I play, Max Mayfair. He's a um, combination of a wonderful throwback to more you'd see characters out of the maybe 50s and 60s. He's real old school. He's a professional safecracker, and he was a wizard at it as a kid. So what happens is uh, the success he finds as a safecracker leads him one day to say, you know what, enough. I'm out of here. The problem is that you don't never escape that history. And all of a sudden, all these characters start looming in the background from his past and come crashing down in his world again. You're my grandfather. So Barbara finds herself completely alone in the world. She knows about this grandfather that she has, and she goes to look for him. She is a very strong girl. She knows what she wants. She knows how to manipulate people when she needs to. She's got the, the, the gangster blood from Max, that's for sure. She brings to the surface the most profound memories this man has ever had, which is the first genuine and only love of his life. And he had to walk away from it simply because he did not fit in to that world, which is a devastating factor that he's never recovered from. How old Maria? She died six months ago. Ava is another character that comes completely unexpected into his life. I think the reason he is so smitten with her is probably she's the most reliable, accountable woman he's ever met. They don't make them like you anymore. So Ava is the den mother. She looks out for everybody and she's graceful and, you know, but she can kick ass as well. She is the anchor. For Max. She is what grounds him, what keeps him honest. She is in love with Max and probably has been for quite a while and slowly but surely those barriers kind of fall away and she can be herself and it's a wonderful, wonderful journey that she goes on. At the same time, because of his background, you know, his friends uh, are still in a very limited world, so... He's not uh, unaccustomed to resorting to a crime if it's utterly necessary. What the hell? Maxie John, how you doing? Max J. I play Armin. I was the short, fat guy that they always made fun of. So one day I'm sitting in the principal's office and Max was there because he's the coolest kid in school and I made him laugh. And after I made him laugh, we were friends forever and nobody made fun of me again. I play Max. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I play Mike, and I'm an old pal of Max. We, we grew up together. The three of us were pals. We also were involved in a little crime, but made enough money for him to get out. So he's left us to our own means in New York City. 
You fucking killed a made man. You were just supposed to hit him on the head. We go to London and pop in on, on Max, who's living the life. And with us comes problems. But it's the three buddies together, and he comes up with a solution. <laughs> we're, we're along for the ride. <laughs> I'll see you in a minute. Welcome to London, boys. Part of the arc of the story is him learning to accept, to have faith in people. And his journey is he's a man who has only relied only on himself. His, uh, his character arc is to learn to really accept these people and welcome them and cherish them into his life. Hey, there's a man of the hour, huh? Hey guys, I want you to meet Sophie. This is a woman that keeps this place happening. She's my right hand. Okay, so I play Sophie in Mr. Mayfair, who is the manager of the club, but she's also Max's right-hand woman as far as business goes. There is another element that in the whole club setting, we are a family. So while all of our characters have a very different past and might not be the sort of people that you'd bring together, in this club, we are all together and we are all a family. My character, Ben, he's a guy that, I, he's sort of fallen on hard times and he's come over to England and uh, he helps Max out in this, uh, uh, in, a, in a little scuffle. <laughs> he gets offered a job, he gets offered an opportunity. He's really appreciative of it. He's ex-military, so he's, a, he's an honorable, respectful man, hardworking, uh, and he's a lot of history. So my character, Kenny, he runs the PR for Mr. Mayfair. Kenny brings a good dash of the comedy. Hello! Uh, he's uh, very flamboyant. I'm sure you can tell from what I'm wearing. Yeah, he's just fun. I would love to be friends with Kenny. What are you doing? It's for my online followers. Thousands of them, they must know I'm international. My character, Charlie, he's been running, pretty much running all his life, but he always wanted to play the blues and find a place that he could use all his talents for music. And uh, he finds himself in London and Max Mayfair takes him in. So he has a place where he can breathe, we can play music, and no one will find him, and he can be safe. What do you think of all this mess, Sally? Yeah. You know me, boss. One ear to the blues, and the other to what's going down. My part uh, is very small uh, in Mr. Mayfair. I play uh, Paul Mariani uh, because uh, uh, Armand uh, told me, oh, you should create a character for you. And of course, I ended up playing the part of the Marseille uh, gangster godfather, which was fun. The very first scene, I was very tense. So I arrived on set, I was screaming at everybody, because that was the scene, but I was like really totally out of control. And then I came out of the set and I said, you gotta calm the fuck down. <laughs> Max is a dear friend of ours. We had to come all the way to kick your fucking ass. Now, if you learn your fucking respect, don't you know what respect is, company? Yes, Don Baggio. Shut the fuck up! <laughs> that was crazy. After that, it was much more relaxed. Serena, what do you say? Serena is part of that previous world of Max Mayfair. Um, they had a romantic past, and she worked closely with Max and Paul. Oh. She's highly ambitious, ruthless, very intelligent. She knows how to work people. And any situation that she gets herself into, she finds a way of, of using it in her favor. But like everybody, she still has a, a vulnerable core. And I think it really rocks her that he's been able to sort of put that side of his life to one side and create this new identity and have these very real relationships. And it's, it sort of highlights for her what she doesn't have perhaps in her life. The plot goes in so many different uh, directions, but in a sense, the granddaughter comes and drags them back to Portugal. When they get back to London, they um, are infiltrated by MI6, which invites more and more uh, criminal elements into Max's life. Now he's a double agent. It started out being a mob film, and then it became a mob slash dark comedy. 
Hey, I'm leaving. Ah! Oh, fuck, man. <laughs> Scared the shit out of me. And now I think it's really unique because it's a mob slash comedy musical. The moment that it changed was when we were shooting the breakfast scene and Philippe came in and sort of threw the script out the window. The scene was boring. I'm sitting with the props guy, Frederick. I will never forget that moment because he came and he said, Philippe, for the breakfast, we were supposed to have bacon, but uh, we couldn't find the bacon. So maybe we're gonna put some cereal and milk. And, and I was listening to him and, and something in my head went crazy and I say, fuck the breakfast, we're gonna dance. And so they all look at me like, what is he talking about? And I went to see the cast and I said, okay, there is no dialogue, there is no breakfast. You're gonna go behind the counter and you're gonna have fun and you're gonna dance on the theme song of Mr. Mayfair. And so at first the, the actors were like, okay, he's gone, you know, he's crazy. And, uh, and we did it. And, and that moment, that day, I think we were like one week into shooting, uh, changed completely the philosophy of the film because as soon as I saw the footage, I knew that I, I found the heart of, uh, of Mr. Mayfair. Oh, the most glamorous bed and breakfast you've ever had. Of Mayfair He's the king, he's the face of the night dance until the morning light. Ultimately, Mr. Mayfair, it's pure entertainment. You know, it's not a show, it's not Shakespeare, it's, it's pure fun. Pure fun and great music. Like we did the music before we started to shoot. It was a long process because we tried to find a lot of singers that uh, would be great. My wife called me and she told me, we, we just, at the time we just moved to York in England, and she told me that she saw on the street two young musicians from the States playing. They're called Govardo, Jack and Dom. And she said, they're fantastic. I said, okay, whatever. And then one day we're driving in the car and she put a, a CD in the car. And I said, those, this is good. Who are those guys? And she said, those are the guys. So I told them to come on the, uh, the studio. And I said, come back in three days with a song. And it was perfect. The other component is uh, my friend Chiro Sini, who owns a club in London, uh, has many singers. And he introduced me to one of his singers called Billy Phillips, who has that vibe of the 60s of Vegas. And Billy composed some wonderful songs and performed them, because both Billy and Govardo uh, do perform on the stage of uh, Mr. Mayfair. By setting it in a club, He's able to actually have actors that can sing, can perform. So when I see someone performing these, these numbers, and they're all different, and they're all perfect, it's startling to me. The preparation that's gone into it way before I entered the project. The club looks so beautiful, and it was so well made, and it looks so real, and you know, I think that when we got into the club scenes, we really understood what was it about. It was a, a, a big difference for everyone. I think even for Philip, the director, I felt also on him a difference. Suddenly we see the magic. The club that was built is a, is a beautiful throwback. Could be 30s, 40. You don't know what generation you're in. And it has the atmosphere of something that could, could evoke music from maybe the US maybe from Europe, maybe from France, maybe from England, from anywhere in the world. It's a real old fashioned kind of deco type environment. In the movie, we get the opportunity to perform a song. I have to tell you, the composer did such a fun, energetic, crowd grabbing, get on your feet type of song. That was an absolute joy. And of course, Armin comes on stage and just steals the show. It turns into chaos then. I'm playing the win. I'm rolling in dough, and next thing you know, I'm wearing a grin. Cause I got all these chicks lining up for a kiss. The best thing I can do as a musician is to try and get in the minds 
of the director and try and imagine what they're imagining. You know, I sit down with the guitar and sometimes just close my eyes and just start to imagine those scenes, how that would start, how the instruments would start, how the band would start. And then you just let the song take you from there. That's the way I've always written music, is I let the song take me on a journey. Most of my friends will tell you that I can't dance very well. I do dad dancing, but I love it. I love music. This movie has got so many great songs in it and so many opportunities to just let go and be free that it's unlike anything I've ever done before. And it's been an incredible, wonderful experience. How was it to work with Philip Martinez? It was great. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> he has more energy than anybody I know. He is a wild man. He's spontaneous. I'm sure that you've heard that sometimes he just throws the script out the window. He does so many things at once, you know. He does like the work of 10 people, like his his brain is crazy. I don't think he sleeps. Um, you know, I think he's um, a very passionate man and has a clear vision of how he wants to sort of tell a story and create a, a sort of wonderful visual effect. Once in a lifetime you meet bigger than life characters who have a passion for what they do. And he has a passion for music. He also has a big heart and a passion for people. Philippe is amazing to work with. And he is so theatrical in the way that he sees things that it's not really a film set, it's a stage set. And you really feel like you are doing a performance. And every day he comes in with these amazing ideas and it's just his vision is absolutely inspiring. So what we're going to shoot today, right now, is the first scene of the movie where Max Mayfair enters, like the king of Mayfair that he is, into the club. Philippe is a real presence. Oh, say yesterday, <laughs> all my troubles seem so far away. I really like his style because he's not committed to text. <laughs> he's quite a taskmaster. Um, he knows what he wants from his actors. And he's also very quick with ideas and with new ideas because he sees the movie in his head. You can see the imagination the guy's got as he's walking around set. You can see his brain is going 200 miles per hour. And he knows what everyone's doing at every moment. And I've just been so impressed by it. He took a semi-unknown singer and he didn't give her any lines. He explained to her what the situation was. She's been rejected in real life. And he said, this has happened to you, right? You wanted to be a singer and now you're at Mayfair's. Everything is coming. Now, what do you say? Please, God, make them love me. I need this. I give it my heart and my voice and everything I have. The family. So Mr. Mayfair became a family. Uh, really, it's like a family. And, and I'm glad to see that not only on stage and off stage, they have managed to keep that, that family spirit. When, you, when you're part of a film crew, it's because you love making films. They work endless hours and it's intense. Of course, they, everybody needs a job, but it's because they love that job. You know, I'm what we call a veteran now. And at my age, I love nothing more than finding new talent and help them to get their shot at getting into the movie business. As a producer, you want to find new directors. You know, you want to find the talent. So when the, the time came to decide who was going to do the, the fifth chapter of Mayfair, uh, which is called Serena's Game, uh, and after I, I saw how uh, uh, Lisa worked on the first for Mayfair, uh, I told her I wanted to direct it. And I saw that woman basically for the last year, every day, working tirelessly uh, because she loves films. I have to say that she's extremely well prepared. She knows the character. The cast responds to her direction. It's lovely to see that she, she took out the torch and carries the, 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 the next Mayfair. So she's a wonderful person. I feel that I'm, I've been replaced.
um, taking on the last film in a series when that series is very much owned and you know directed and produced by Philippe. So it was it was a big deal for me to take that on. I found it was a very collaborative experience because they knew the characters really well by now. They had lived through four films with these characters and they'd all come a long way. I was coming to it with something new. And so it was a real collaboration for us on, on set. Well, working with Armand was an absolute dream come true for me. Um, I love his previous work. And what I really liked about working with him was the amount of preparation that he put. We would get together, we would talk through the scenes that were coming up. Um, at the weekends, we spent plenty of time together rehearsing and talking things through. Working with Armand is really like driving a Ferrari. Uh, because he's a beautiful, strong actor. Um, he's an actor that doesn't compromise. And my job as a director is to really to, to drive him, you know, because he's got so much power that you want to contain that power. Sometimes you want him to be a little bit less or sometimes a bit more, you know. When I wrote it, you know, I, I had him in my mind all the time. You know, the, the choice of Armand was uh, evident. The main memory I'm going to take away from, from working on Mr. Mayfair is how much I just felt this is where I belong. When The last time I felt like this was when I first picked up a guitar. There's been some amazing memories, my stunt scene, which was unexpected and incredible and so much fun. And I think that I learned a lot about myself as an actress from just doing that. So many cool memories. The locations, for one, beginning in Miami Beach, which Miami, my hometown, and then Portugal, which the beautiful, beautiful landscape, the beautiful setting of the beaches and, and the people, the style of life in, in the south of Portugal. And then jumping into the big city in London and the hustle bustle and the, of, uh, of Max's the nightclub setting. Really, for an independent project, this is one of the best teams in my life I've ever worked with. Just a tremendous commitment from the crew, from the composers, from everyone involved in it, uh, from the top to the bottom. Amazing experience. Okay, one more time. We don't be so dramatic. Don't be so dramatic. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I am dramatic. The time machine to a general machine. Fuck, fix this club. It's a disgrace. What I mean looks like old time to buy and then I love you for me. And thanks to Mr. Max Mason. One more, please.